Okay. I can see we have people in the people in the session. Yeah, if you can hear me, just um, type in yes in the chat box. Yeah, I know. What the fuck is this doing? Yeah, if you can hear me, um, say yes in the chat box. Let's wait for others to join us. It's almost time. I think some people may think it's seven o'clock for today. But it's six o'clock actually. Einstein, I can see you. Okay, Akko, I can see you. That means I'm heard then. Okay, tell me I can see you. Okay, it's six o'clock now. Let's wait for let's wait for I think five minutes or so, three or five minutes for others to join us so that we can start fully. Yeah, Abdul, I can see you. I'm doing well, and how are you? That's great. Okay, we have 12 people in the session. Okay, we have we have more people coming in. Okay. So I think um we can just get started and as others join us, they will just um, start from where, from where they meet us. So I would share my screen, and if you can see my screen, you indicate by saying yes in the chat box.
Okay, Kautha, welcome. So it means I am live and you can see my screen. So, um, welcome everyone. So today we are going to focus on just bubble. And uh, we are going to build the web application that we have designed in Figma into a working web application, a live working web application. So I'll start from scratch once more by creating a new bubble app so that um, anyone having difficulties will have that sorted. Now, take note of the steps and the action so that your results will be the same as mine and so that you can learn better. So I'll start by creating a new bubble application. And as you all know, you have to be signed up to bubble after you sign up, then you log into your Bubble account so that you can be able to create a new Bubble application. So I'll come here to my Bubble, um, to my Bubble account. I would click on Create a New here. When I do that, I would enter the name of the app I want to create. I would say Job Lesson App. You can call yours whatever you want to call it, and I would select directory listings here then i would answer this question is it customer facing or internal i would say external or customer facing then i would come here and i would select what's your goal with this application i would say to start a business then i would click on create a new app when i do that i would wait for some seconds for the app to be created in bubble Just some seconds. Now, after you click on create a new app, yeah, and the app is being created, you will be brought um, to, this, to this page here, to this place. Now, the next thing you do here is to come here and click on start with a blank page here. Click on start with a blank page first. Then click on close the assistant. When you do that, you would have this page show up. Now, this page, all this region that you are seeing, this place is called the Bubble Editor. And it's in this Bubble Editor that you will build the front end and the back end of your web application. Now, this is how it works. This, this is how it works here in Bubble. To build the front end, to build the front end of a web application in Bubble, you'd click on design here. Like you have, you need to have design here selected. You can ask Cursor is on. Design here. You need to have it selected. It is when you select design here that you will have your Bubble editor look like this. With all of these tools here. As you can see, all of these are tools here. It is when you click on design here that you have all of these showing up. And it is all of these tools here. You can see where my mouse cursor is on. It is all of these tools here that you will use to build the front end of a web application here in Bubble. And for you to build the database of a web application here in Bubble, you would come and click on data. You see where my mouse cursor is on. When you click on data here, you would have all of these options show up here. Now, all of these that's showing up here are the tools that you will need to build a database for a web application here in Bubble. So we've seen where to go to if we want to build the front end of a web application here in Bubble, you go to design. If you want to build the database of that same web app, you come here and you click on data and you use the data tools here to build the database of the web application. For you to configure or for you to build the back-end logic of a web application here in Bubble, what you do is you'd come here and click on workflow. You can see where my mouse cursor is on. You'd click on workflow. Now, when you click on workflow, you'd have some tools show up here. Now, it is the tools that will show up here. Currently, we don't have any tools because we have not built any app yet. But 
because when you start building your app, when you click the workflow, you'd have tools show up here. Now it is the tools that will show up here that you will use to configure or to build the back end logic of the web application that you are building here in Bubble. Now, just to make this easier, I know some people here and are, are new to the concept of building web applications in general. I know some people here are not developers and, and, and some people don't have experience with software development. So uh, what I'll do is I'll use two minutes to break down the architecture and the structure of a web application for you so that you can understand how web applications are built. So let's come here in Figma. Let's let demonstrate how that works here in Figma. So when you see a web application here, when you see a web application, the web application will have the front end. Let me make this really big. The web application will have the front end. Now, the front end of a web application, remember I talked about web application is. A web application like Amazon, Jumia, Conga, um, Alibaba, it's an application that you use in, in your web browser. That, that's what a web application is. So a web application will have a front end and the front end is what you see in the browser. Now. That front end is relying on a back end. It is that back end that all the magic happens, like all the logic, all the calculations, and all the data processing. It happens at the back end. Now, this back end itself is divided into two sections. The back end has what we call the logic and the database. Now let's um, make this. Let's bring this here. Now for the back end. Now for the back end, the the back end is the back end is divided into logic, back end logic. I would explain what the back end logic is actually. Um, let's make this smaller. So you have the back end logic. Then, then you have the database. All of these exist at the back end of the web application. So for every web application that you see, what you are seeing is the front end. Now this front end is always tied to the back end. And at the back end, you have the back end logic. Okay, that's database. That's correct. Thank you for that. So at the back end, you have the back end logic and the database. So this is how it happens there. The database is where all of the data all of the data at um, for that web application is stored, like the names of like the usernames, the password, the price, the calculation, the history, the record, all of that is being stored here in the database. Now, this logic here is like a bridge between the front end and the database. It is this logic, it is at this logic that the software engineer will write how the data here should be fetched and displayed at the front end. And it is at this logic point that the software engineer will also write how the data will be fetched from the front end and saved in the database. So if, for example, I am creating a product price, yeah? Like, let's say, sorry if I'm taking your time, I'm just trying to explain this better. Let's say I am creating a product price, like a, like a product card on the front end. And um, I want the users to actually buy a shoe, right? To buy a shoe. I would say buy a shoe. Now, I would like to display the price here, right? I would say $25. And I would say, um, 
Nike. Now, it is this price will be fetched from the database because it is the database that will have the records of how much this shoe this shoe cost. So the, this price and the shoe name will be fetched from the database. And it is at this back end logic here that I would say when we want to fetch the first detail about the this buy a shoe to the front end, just fetch only the price and the name of the shoe first. And when the users click on this buy a shoe and they go to the details page of that shoe, now let them see all of this with the delivery option. Now we can now display um, free delivery. We can display tax cost. We can display insurance, understand? We can display more details when they click on this shoe. They can now see more details. Now it is at this back end logic that you okay, fine. Fetch it like this, fetch social and social so -so data, display it on the front end. When the user is on the second page, fetch another another type of data and display it on that page for the user. And it is and it is at this back end logic. Now take note, all of these data are being fetched from the database, right? But it is still at the same logic point that I would say, okay, on the front end, when the users want to sign in, they should sign in with their username and password. Now, at this back end logic, the software engineer will, will write a code that will only fetch or that will only recognize username and password when the user wants to log in. And it is at this back end logic point that the software engineer will say, take the username and password that the user has typed into the login form, send it to the database and confirm if that user with that record exists in the database. And if the user exists, then send a message to the front end for that user to be logged in. So you can see that this logic point plays a huge role at the back end. It plays a huge role at the back end. So I hope this is clear, yeah? If it's clear, uh, you, 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 you can just say yes in the chat box. Okay, then. So this front end of a web application, if you want to build a web application in Bubble, this front end, you will build it with this design section here. You will click on design here and use all of this section to build the front end. This logic here that is controlling how things happen, yeah, between the front and the back. If you want to design a logic for your web application, you will come here in Bubble and you will use this workflow tab here to design the back end logic. And if you want to design your database where your data will be stored, you will come here in Bubble and you will use this data section here to do that. So I hope that's clear. Design is front end, workflow is back end logic, and data is database. So I, I believe that's clear to everyone. So now that we understand, um, now that we understand how web applications are built, yeah, let's start with building the front end of our own web application that we have designed in Figma, this web application here. Actually, I did not have time to build or to design the high fidelity screens. We are going to use the low fidelity screens. If you have designed the high screens completely, you share it in the chat box for others to open and bet we are going to use the little high fidelity and all of these low fidelities to come up with our app. So this is the app that we are going, this is the design that we are going to build into a live web application. Now, first things, to come here in Bubble, make sure you click on design, make sure you are on the design um, section here in Bubble because it is with this design section that we will build the front end. So let's work on the front end first. Now, for you to know that design is selected or workflow is selected or, or, is, or data is selected, when design is selected, you will see that it is blue. The icon is blue, but these ones are not blue. If I select workflow, you see that workflow is now blue. The icon of workflow is now blue and others are not blue. So keep design selected. 
Now, when you select design, the next thing will be to start the building of the front end, which we want to start doing now. So when you want to start building the front end of the web application, we are going to build the home page first. This is our home page. Now, this is called the home page. Now, this is called the home page because this is like the first page that the user will come to when they visit our web application in the browser. So that's why it is called the home page. Most times in development, it is called the index page. It is called the index page. Index. That's what's called professionally in development. So, but we all know it as home page. So, we are going to to, to build this home page. Yeah? To build this home page of our web application, we are going to need a layout here in Bubble that we will design or that we will build the home page on. Just like in Figma, yeah. To design the home page in Figma. Like to design the home page in Figma, yeah? you can remember that I needed a layout to design this home page. And I came here and I selected MacBook Pro 16, right? And when I selected the MacBook Pro 16 layout, I started designing the home page element on that MacBook Pro 16 layout. Now, we need a layout like this that we will build the front end of web application on in Bubble. We need a layout like this also. But the good thing is this. In Bubble, Bubble actually creates a layout automatically for you. Not like Figma where you will be the one to come here, select a layout, bring it into your canvas, and start designing on the layout. In Bubble, that's different. The layout is created automatically for you in the Bubble canvas. And this whole white, all this white space here, is called the bubble canvas. All this white space here is called the bubble canvas. But the layout, which is inside the canvas, is from this blue line here. You would see that when I hover my mouse here, you see a blue line that's, that's here on the left side, and it stops here on the right side. Now, everything in between these two blue lines is our layout. Now, just and just in case you don't have these grid lines on your own layout eh? is this come here at the top here click on grid and borders when you click on grid and borders select show grid here you'd see a show grid option here select it when you select it you'd have grid lines showing up on your own layout now your grid lines may not look like mine exactly but you will definitely have grid lines show up on your own layout so, so I've identified our homepage layout inside the bubble canvas. Now, what we are going to do next will be to configure the homepage layout, which is this, so that we can start building the designs of our homepage on it. That's always important. Whenever you create a page in bubble or whenever you create a layout that will be used as a page in bubble, it is important that you configure the page first. You configure the layout and use that layout to build your page it's very it's very important so the first thing to do as to configure our home page layout like the first thing we will do configuration process of our home page layout will be to upgrade our home page layout so that it will be using the new bubble responsive engine that is modeled after css flexbox now this is an important thing for you to do the responsiveness of your bubble web application will depend on this upgrade. Now, to configure our with this upgrade, yeah, we need to access the property window of this home page layout. Now, I would come here and I'll write it. We need to access the property of our home page layout here in Bubble. And to understand what a property window is, yeah, because it may sound strange, to, to understand what it is, it's simple. Now, remember in Figma, now, as you can see, I, I am using Figma to, to describe many things in Bubble. Now, remember, 
Uh, in Figma here, yeah, if you create a layout, for example, if I create a tablet layout like this, and I want to, let's say, configure the layout to have a blue layer, it means that what I'll do, I'll keep the layout selected like this, come here in the property panel of Figma on this right side here, and I'll use the color property here to change the layout color to blue, right? That's how to do it in Figma, right? Now, in Bubble here, you'd see that we don't have a property panel on the right side here that we can configure our own layout, which we have here, or any object we have here in our canvas. We don't have a property panel here to use, but it is done in Bubble is that But, but the way it is bubble is that each object or each layout has its own property window that you can use to configure it. And to access the property window of a layout or object at all, double click on that layout or double click on the object. Now let's double click on our own homepage layout. I'll double click on it now. When you double click on it, you would have the property window of layout show up. Now, this is the property window here. This dark, um, tall box here. This is the property window for our homepage layout. Now, any configurations here yeah, that I make on this will only affect this homepage layout that I double clicked on. So, for us to use this property window to upgrade our home page layout to start using the new bubble responsive engineer here and click on upgrade you can see where my cursor is on click on upgrade responsive here when you click on it then select upgrade when you select upgrade you give it some seconds for your layout to be upgraded to start using the new bubble responsive engine and let's give it some seconds and it has been upgraded now you have this window show up don't care about this just come here and cl click on x here to close this and that's fine so after upgrading our home page layout to be using the new bubble rest the next thing will be to configure our home page layout container direction like the next thing will be for us to call the container direction of this home page layout and by container direction i mean the direction in which elements that are placed inside this layout will be placed now if that sounds confusing don't worry about it let's go to figma and let's explain it better so i would come here in figma i would create a layout and when i create this layout, i would make it an auto layout I'll use this to express what I mean by layout container direction. Now, this auto layout that I have created here, you can see that for this auto layout, in the auto layout settings, there are two direction properties here. This is vertical direction and horizontal. If I select vertical direction, what it will mean is that whatever I place inside the auto layout, placed horizontally, just watch. If I place this inside this auto layout, it will vertically. And vertical means from top to bottom, right? Now you can see that whatever I bring inside this auto layout will always be placed vertically. And the reason is because the auto the layout direction property is set to vertical direction. Now, if I come here and I change it to horizontal direction you see that every item inside the auto layout, inside this layout, which is an auto layout, will now be placed horizontally. So it is still the same concept when you create a layout in Bubble. You need to, you need to set the direction that the object in the layout will be placed or will be positioned. Objects are brought into the layout. Now, if that's clear, I'd like everyone to say yes, I'd like to open some people to say yes in the chat box, if that's clear, so that I can, I can proceed. Okay, then. So, um, 
to for us now to set that that container direction to this our home page layout in bubble what you do again is double click layout for the property window to show up now when the property window shows up come here click on layout when you click on layout you'll see a property here that says container layout it is currently set to fixed click on fixed and change it to column now the reason why i'm changing this to column is because column is a vertical directional um, stuff like column means going from when you arrange things from top to bottom so column is vertical column is a vertically placed direction row is from right to left or from or from left to right so me setting this to column means that i want every item placed inside this our uh, home page layout be placed in a column pattern like it should be it should be stacked column wise so whatever i place now inside this home page layout will be placed column wise from top to bottom and this is why it is important this is why it is important to set your um, page layout to have a column value for the container layout here let's come to bubble let's come to figma and let's do that now if i create a layout here uh, for example and i set the direction of the container layout to column or to vertical direction it means any other container that i create inside this container will be placed in a column direction from top to bottom right just like this let me add a stroke color here it will be placed from top to bottom like this let's bring in another container so this is what we will have uh, it means that whatever you bring inside this layout will be placed in a column pattern like from top to bottom now this is why it is good websites are mostly viewed from top to bottom like if you go to a website you keep scrolling down or you keep scrolling up right now if i create this this my layout to to have its elements stacked like this i can come here now inside this container here and i can then divide inside this container now i can divide the container into two like this i can divide it into two now this division that is happening is not in a column direction it's not in a vertical direction it is now a horizontal direction i can afford to change the direction of this particular column of this particular container or this particular frame here can decide to change its own direction to row because me changing it to row means that i would have one section here and one section here now these two small containers inside this container here still are containers and i can come inside these two small containers and say i want the items inside this one to be placed in a column direction also just like this And I can come in, I want things here, inside here, to be placed in a column direction also. So you can see that why this is possible is because the first frame, remember I mentioned in a previous class that layouts are containers, like layouts are containers themselves. So this frame here, this frame seven is our parent container. Like it is the main container that contains every other frames and every other containers inside of it. Now, this is our layout. Frame seven is the layout. Me setting it to have a vertical direction for its, for its elements means that I was able to place this major container at the top here, place this at the bottom, place this at the bottom i have been able to divide the layout space vertically now inside all of this division that i created i can come in there and then divide them and start placing things anyhow horizontally or vertically just the, just the way i want now when i am done it means that i am done creating this section i can come down here and do another direction 
come down here and create another direction. As I keep doing it like that, you will see that when you are done, you would have a full website structure where you can place elements anywhere at all. So that's how websites are actually built behind the scene. That's how websites are built behind the scene. So if this is clear, I would like everyone to tell me that it's clear so that I can proceed. If it's not clear, you ask questions so that's okay. Now, the next thing, so after setting this to column here, the next thing to do here for this uh, layout here in bubble will be to set the width, which is the wideness, the width and the height of our homepage layout. Now to set the, now to set the width, come here, it is set to 1080. I would set this to 1200. When you type in 1200 there, press the enter key on your keyboard to have it saved. Then I would come here and I would set height to any number at all. I can set it to 1000 to 2000, but I'll just come here, I'll set it to, let's say 1000. We can increase the height later, but like I, like I mentioned in the last class, the width is the most important property when you are designing a responsive web page. So I'll set this to 1000 and that's okay. So what we have done so far is, what we have done so far is, we have configured our layout. We have upgraded it to use the current bubble responsive in set the container layout property to column, set the height and set the width. It means that we are ready to build the or the front end of the home page on this our home page layout here. So before we do that, I would like to let you know that um, whatever that you see that is being placed on a website is data. Like if I come here now and I come to this website, whatever that we see on this website is information. Okay, the website is loading. Okay. So whatever you are seeing here is data is data or information, anyhow you want to call it. Now, on our homepage here, all of these that we have here are data, different types of data, different type of information that we are displaying for users of our web application to see and make use of, right? Now, but the thing is, when you are building a web application here, there are three types of, there are three major types of data that you will deal with when you are building a web application. And these three types of, these three major types of data are static data. I would write this, static data, dynamic data, and impute data. These are the three major types of data that you would come across when you are building a web application. Whether it is with Bubble or whether it is with JavaScript, you would always come across these three major types of data anywhere. Now, I'd like us to understand what a static data is and how to identify a static data on a web application when we see one. And I would like us to know what dynamic data is and how to identify a dynamic data on a web application when we see one. And also, we are going to talk about the input data. Now, static data on a web application, yeah, or on even a mobile app, static data is the type of data that, that is not affected by a concurrent factor. It is not affected by any real-time factor. Like if I come to this website, like you see this text there that says where the world builds software. Static. If you come to the website next year, it's still going to be where the world builds software. If I come here next week, it will be this. Except GitHub as a company change manually. You get. But if I go to a weather app, yeah. If I come to this weather app here. Yeah? I'm just taking, for example, 
Okay, it's taking time to load. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, um, great. Are you still experiencing audio issues? Okay, someone is saying, are we not supposed to set our width to match the width of the... Okay, no, Adewale, you are not supposed to set the width to match the width of the, of the Figma layout. Yeah, you are not supposed to. In Figma, we are setting this to full width. So 1,200 is just what we are using to build. We are not setting it to the to the stuff um, to the stuff. Okay, then. So now on this website, this web application, yeah, this 36 degrees here, right? It's not a static. Data. It's a it's a dynamic data that changes as long as the weather in Abuja changes. Like if the weather in Abuja becomes hotter, this data will go up on its own. Nobody will change it manually. If the weather comes colder, this data here, this number will reduce on its own without anybody changing it manually. You see this data here, like even on this website, you see this data here, which is the logo that says the weather channel. It is static. It is always going to be there as the weather channel. If it has to change, it means the company that owns this web application will have to manually change it by themselves. But data like this is dynamic. Now, if you go to Twitter, yeah, for example, the data on Twitter is dynamically gotten. Like what you, what you see on Twitter is not written by you. You get, it is not written by you. It is gotten from the database of Twitter. Like when I, when I tweet, for example, it goes to, to the database of Twitter, it gets saved there. Now, when you load your Twitter, Twitter automatically fetches the data, my own tweets, and shows to you. You are not the one that requests for Twitter to show it to you. Twitter automatically shows it to you. So such data is not a static data. It is such data is a dynamic data, the type of data that is it is being displayed based on factors affecting it. But static data, but static data is just there. You put it there by yourself, take it out there by yourself. Now let's talk about input data. Input data is like when you want to type in your username. It is any data you yourself have to input into a web application. Like when you have to input your username, your date of birth and, and all of that, that is input data. You are inputting that type of data. And so many web applications have it. Like you can see here, I would have to input my email address to sign up for GitHub. Now, whatever I input here is an input data. It's a data that I had to input. So most web applications are built around static data because of course you need static data to sell some type of information like GitHub needs this here to sell their brand. Now, GitHub needs an input data so that I can enter my email address for them to keep in touch with me. This weather app here needs this dynamic data to be relevant, to show me how the weather changes and the number that the weather has. If I come here tomorrow, this, or if I come here this evening, this figure will change because it is a dynamic data. So. Does, does everyone understand the real difference between these three types of data so, that's, so that I can proceed? Okay, then. Okay, then. So, on Bubble, you need to, when you want to build a web application in Bubble, you need to understand or you need to identify which data on your design, yeah? Like on this design. It is necessary for you to identify which data is static, which data is dynamic, and which data is an input data. The reason is because static data are not saved in, in the database. It is you that write it. But dynamic data is always saved in the database and fetched from the database. Input data is collected and sent 
to the database. So it is always important for you to, to identify the type of data that you have on your web application or, or on your design so that you know how to build your application. So on our homepage design now, I would like all of us to identify which data is static, which data is input, which data is dynamic on our homepage here. I would, I would go first. This logo here is a static data because, of course, I'll just upload it. Now, this button here that says post the job contains a static data, which is a test. It is a call to action. It is static. Yes. Now, this text here that says export jobs, it is static. I'll just write it there. It's not coming from the, from the database. I am trying to sell this application to anybody that comes on it. And this text here that says apply for remote jobs under two minutes. But over here, we have an input field here that, that a user enter or input certain data so that they can subscribe to our daily update. Now, we have an input data here. Now, if you come here, scroll, you see that we have job cards here. Now, these job cards contain all contain dynamic data. Reason is because, the reason is because this data, like this UX designer and all of these, are, are information that are being entered by companies who want to hire. It is not we. It is not you, the owner of the app, that wants to hire. It is companies. So companies will be the one to enter all of these deals. And when they enter the details, the details will be saved to the database of our web application. And it will be automatically fetched from the database of our web application and displayed here on the home page for users to see. Just the same way our tweets are automatically fetched from the database of Twitter and displayed on the timeline for everyone to see. So all that we have here are dynamic data. This here is an input data, and all of this here are static data. So it is always important for you, it is always important for you to know that. If there are any questions at this point, if there's, okay. So if there are any questions at this point, I would like to take them before I proceed so that we can, I am I'm trying to explain the core so that when I start putting the databases together and the back end flow, I won't have any issues at all. Okay, so if, if um, okay, someone is saying copyright, is it a static data? Yes, copyright is static data. Someone is saying, can input data become dynamic data? Yes what you input can be dynamically gotten from the database and displayed on the front end. So input data in the end will be used as dynamic data. So someone is saying the cards is dynamic data. Yes, that's Chinwek, if I am correct. And um, someone is saying um, static data by developers. Dynamic data is put to one group. I don't understand. Ola Sukpo, you say um, static data is put by use. Okay, that I, mean, I, I, I don't understand your um, question correctly. So, okay, static data is put by us, developers. Dynamic data is input by one group of users. Input data is input by the end. Correct. So that's good. That's good on that support. So, um, what I want us to do now is for us to build, let's start building actually. Everyone is ready for us to start building, or you want me to explain? Okay, let's start building. So, what I would want us to build first, I would want us to build the sections on our home page here that contain static data and input data. That's what I would want us to build. The sections that contain static data and input data and if you look you see that here in our home page this header section contains data this hero section contains static and input data so i would like for us to build that first when we build that then we can when we build that then we can continue from there 
and see how to build the dynamic part of our web application. So let's come here in Bubble. Okay. Is everyone hearing me? James is saying network. Is it my network? Okay. All right then. So first, let's build this header section that has our logo and the job. How do we do it? We will come here in Bubble and to build a header section in Bubble, you would build your header section as a reusable element. In Figma, in, if you come here in, in, in Figma, we have things, we have something like that. It is called assets. You can always reuse components that you can create components and always reuse them. I hope everyone in this session understands what components are and how they work. Now in Bubble, you can, we have something like that. When you want to build the header of, of a web application, you would, you would have to build that header as a reusable element. And to build a reusable element in Bubble, this is what you do. Look at that, scroll down, you would see a section here that says reusable elements. Now, what we want to do is build our own reusable element, element, not what Bubble has here. So to build your own reusable element, come here and click on this button that says new reusable. When you click on it, you would enter the name of the reusable element you want to build. In my case, I would call mine my header. You can call it whatever you want to call it. When you call yours your header, you click on create. When you click on create, Bubble will create a new reusable element for you. And this is it. The reusable element has been created. Currently, it looks like this. This is it here. All this dark space is not part of the element. This is the canvas. This is the reusable element here. Now, it is left for us to configure and build our reusable element the way we want it to be. So what do we do? We need to configure this little reusable element layout that we have here. And as we know, to do that, you'd have to bring up or pull up the property window of this little layout. To do that, double click on this little layout. When you do that, you'll see that the property window for this my header reusable element will show up. And to be sure that this property window belongs to this my header reusable element, if you come here at the top of this property window, you would see the name here. It says my header. So always the property window will carry the name of its element at the top here. And if I want to change it, like if I want to rename this reusable element, I can take out my header and call it their header or whatever I want to call it. But in this case, I'll just say my header, then I'll press the enter key. Now, it is this property window of this my header reusable element that I use to create my header element for my web application. So first things first, I would come here and I would upgrade it. Always remember to upgrade. I would upgrade this to use the current bubble responsive engine. When I click on upgrade, it will be upgraded. And I would wait for that to upgrade. And it has been updated. Now, after the upgrade, I'll come here, I'll double click on the layout once more, and I'll still have the property window show up. Now, I'll come here, first things first, take notes. I'll come here and I'll click on layout. Now, when I click on layout, for my reusable element, I'll set its container layout property from column to align to parent. Now, why I'm changing it from column is because if you come here in this header here yeah, in Figma, you see that this logo is placed here this one is placed here. Like the items inside the header are not placed vertically and they are not actually placed horizontally because you can see there is a very huge gap here. So if I want to place them horizontally, it can work, but it's not going to really be fun if I have to create a very huge space between this and this in my header element. So the best choice is to just align it to parent. Now, aligning to parent means place whatever you will place inside this reusable element 
um, this reusable element here will stay the way you want it to stay inside that inside that re reusable element. If you place it on the right side, it, it will stay on the right side. If you place it on the left side, it will stay on the left side. Wherever you place it, you will be able to configure it to stay wherever you want it to stay inside the reusable element. And that's why I set this to align to parents. Now, I'd advise you can be jotting this down so that you can practice this later on your own. Now, after setting this to align to parents, the next thing I would want is for me to set the width of this R reusable element. If you come here in bubble, you'd see that the width of this header is the same width of our web page. So in, here in bubble, I would also want my width of my header element to be the same as the width of my home page layout in bubble. And my home page layout was set to 1,200. The width of my home page layout was 1,200. So I have set this to 1,200. Now, the next thing I'll do is to come here and set the height to 100. I'll just set the height to 100. And that's OK. That's really perfect. So when I set the width and the height, I would come here. I would click on, on, on appearance. And for the color of the header, in our hi-fi, I think I left it as white, as white. So I won't, I won't change that. I'll just leave the color set to this. But if you want to change the color of your own header element, come here, you'll see a color here, a color property here. It's just like Figma. Click on it, and you change the color to whichever color you want to change it to. But in this case, I'll leave it set to white, and that's OK. So inside our, inside our header, we have the logo here. We are supposed to have the logo here. and we are supposed to have our um, post a job button here. Now, this is where you start honoring. I think someone asked that question. If um, who asked the question, if why are we not using the same width that we were using in Figma? Now, it is at this point that you start using the same width and the same spacing properties that you had in Figma. So, if I come here, I would want to put a logo here. Now. In my case here, I don't have an image, but let's come here and let's create an image. Oh, that's going to take time. What I'm going to do is um, I'll just use text to write logo there. Then we can then proceed from there. So to write a text in bubble on a layout or any mm -hmm. element, come here. You can see where my mouse cursor is on. You see a text tool here, just like Figma. Click text to select it, then bring your cursor inside the layout or the reusable element. Click, hold, and drag till you create a text box like this. When you create a text box, automatically a property window for that text will show up. Now you can see the name of this property window is text A. I can change the name to my logo, just like this. So I can change the name here to my logo, just like this. Now, the next thing will be, how do I change the content of this text or the value of this text that I have created? Because currently, it is showing edit me. That's what we have here. In, in, in Bubble, to do that, when you create a text, you'd have this little box here. It's called Rich Text Editor. Click inside of it. OK, no, it is not called Rich Text Editor. There is an option to have the Rich Text Editor. But you would see this little box here. Click inside of it. When you click inside of it, you would see that automatically Bob will ask me, do you want to insert a dynamic data? But in this case, I don't want. What I want to have there is a static data. So I would, I would take out edit me there. Then I'll type in what I want to have. I would say logo. And when I type in logo, you'd see I have logo show up here. Now, how do I edit that logo text to look better? What I'll do is this. I'll still come here in this property window. I'll scroll down to this section that says style. You'll see that in front of style here, we have this field here. And we have this option that says remove style. Now, in this course, I won't have time to talk about how to create your own styles in Bubble. I'll just like for us to go ahead and remove styles and just use the styles quickly. In a later course, when I have time, maybe next next month or so, we are going to look at creating styles and doing real badass designs in Bubble. So 
I would come here, I would click on remove style. When I click on remove style, Bubble will allow me now to configure this, my logo text manually. So I would want to change the font family. I would go with VM Sans, VM Sans regular. I would make it bold. Then I would like the color of the text to be absolutely black. Then I would like the size to be 16 or 18. 18 is okay. Then for the letter spacing, I would like this to be set to one. Then that's going to be okay for now. That's going to be okay. And that's it. I have designed the text how I want the text to be. Now, if you look at the text, the text is staying at the top of the text box. So to change that, I would scroll down here in the property window. You would see a property here that says center text horizontally. This is it here. Center text horizontally. I'll check it. When I check it, the text will be centered horizontally. Now, what else do we need to do? If you look here, you would see that this text box is too wide for this little text. So we need to reduce the width of the text box. And to do that, come here in the property window of this text field, click on layout. When you click on layout, scroll down to this point where you have width. You'd see a width property here. Currently, it is set to 158. I can just set it to 72. And I'll press the Enter key, and you'll see that the text box has really closed into a reasonable point. Now, still on that layout here, I want you to take note of this parent container type property. Now, we have some buttons here. Currently, our text, which is carrying our logo, is aligned to the vertical center of our layout. This is just like auto layout. Let's come here in Figma. If I select an auto layout, you'll see that when I come here in auto layout, we have this box that has all these sides here, center, top, and all of this. It's just like auto layout. So if you come here, you'll see that it is still the same similar thing. Currently, the logo text is aligned to vertical center of our layout. If I come here and I align it to the bottom, you'll see that it is aligned to the bottom and to the vertical center of the layout. If I click on this, to be aligned to this point. So you can see that this is something similar to Figma. That's why I always insist that for you to actually learn web design, front end engineering better, it is better you understand Figma very, very well, auto layout and all of the principles because it is still the same principles that you use all front end technologies. Now, this same thing that we are doing principles CSS if you have a CSS developer here and 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 you ask the person about flexbox you see that still the same principles that is applicable flexbox so so I'll keep this aligned to the left and to the to the horizontal left, vertical center of these are reusable um, element. So if you come here in a in a Figma design, you see that the logo text stays at this position. There's a 120 margin, 120 pixel margin space on the left side before we have the logo. How do we achieve that here? What I'll do is this. I'll scroll down to this point. I am in the bottom where we have we have margin property bottom left. I would set the property for the left to 120 and it's going to always. So you know how easy this is. Now don't do this so simple as that. Because it's to create the post a button that we, that we will have here. I would come here to create a button in bubble is easy the button you can see where my mouse cursor is on when you click come here drop that you has been created now, now if you are with the button come here in the button property window click on layer come here and set the button i'll i like to 42 
and the week to one I can see in my own case, and that's okay. Now you can see that all aligned to the right side of the reusable element and vertical center of the reusable element. It's going to change. So you, you can see how this works. As simple, I'll keep and. What I'll do next is and change the name of the button here. I'll take out button A there. I'll say post a job button. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Actually, naming this is just like you naming your frames here in Figma. It is done so that you would properly track your whole process. That's why it is really important to that. Okay, somebody said that should come again on the margin of the logo. Now, the margin. The logo here, if I click on it, this is the property window. If I imagine left property of 120 pixels for the logo, it means that a space between the logo on the left side will be created between the logo and the end of this reusable element. That's why, as you can see, if I keep my mouse on top of this section here, you have 120 pixels showing. So that's it. So. I hope that's clear. Now let's go back to our button. I'll double click on our button for the property window of the button to show up. Now it's time for us to change the color of this button. To do that, I would come here, I would click on remove style. When I click on remove style, be careful of how you edit this. Take note of what you are editing. First things first is to change the font family of the text that is on the button. I'll change the font family to BM Sans. I'll keep it set to 14 and I'll make it bold. Now, the text on the button is white. I'll keep it set to white. And I'll set the letter spacing value to one, actually, to one. Then I'll scroll down, and you'll see that this is where you change the color of the button here, not this section here. This one is for the text of the button. I'll change the color of the button from this to something dark like this. You can change it to any color of your choice, actually, and that's OK. That's really okay. So the next thing I would like to change is the roundness, like the corner radius of the button. In Figma, this is where you do it, right? In Bubble, you'd see a roundness property here. And to change the roundness property, what you do is, what you do is come here. You can set any value of your choice here, or you can manually type in a value. I would set this to four, actually. Four is okay for me. And that's okay. That's okay. So we have we have our button here. Now, what about this button text that says edit me? Is that what we are supposed to have? No. What we are supposed to have is post the job. To change this, I would come here. You can see here in the property window, we have the same section at the top here that says edit me. When I click inside that section, Bubble will still ask me, do you want to insert a dynamic data? Actually, I don't want. I want to insert a static data. So I would say post a job, just like that. And if I come back here in Figma, you'd see that the button also has a margin space at the end here, and it is set to 120 pixels. So I would come here, I would keep the button property window up, I would click on layout, scroll down, and if I come here at the bottom here, you see we have the margin section, I would set the right margin value to 120, just like this. And I would close this. Now you can see that we have our logo and the post a job button. So is, is anyone lost? Shama, you say your button isn't showing. Okay, I would like you to explain when you click button color, when you click on when you click on button when you come here click hold and drag like this if your button is not showing then you change the color quickly come here click on remove style then change the color if it is white change your color to any other color and see if the button is going to show up if you do that let me know if it's sorted so my header took the whole took the whole width of my payout of my layout space. 
Yes, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. Like, as long as you set the width here to 1,200, it's not a problem. Probably it's the size of your own laptop screen that's causing that. That's not a problem. Check the settings here to, to be sure that your settings are correct. Align to parent, 1,200, and that's okay. So any other questions? Um, Shama has, okay, button is sorted. My logo is not at the center. No, the logo is not supposed to be at the center, actually. You can see where mine is at. It's not at the center. This is not at the center also. This is the center here. We don't have anything there. So can we proceed? Okay, then. Okay, then. So, so when you create your reusable element like this, like the header, it is always important in, fig, in bubble to check how it will look like on all devices. Remember, it is supposed to be a responsive design. So it is important to check how it will look like when you want to preview it on other devices. And in Bubble, to check that, you see a responsive tab here. Now take note, we are still in the design section. Don't change, don't go out of this section. You come here, click on responsive here. See where my mouse cursor is on. We have UI Builder and we have responsive here. Now when you click on responsive, you'd be taken to this section. Now. If you look here at the top, you see that we have a laptop or a desktop icon, a tablet icon, then we have a landscape mobile device and a portrait mobile device. So currently, this is selected. It means that this is how your header will look like on a laptop or a desktop. If I select this, it means that this is how this header will look like on a tablet. If I select this, it means that that this is how this header will look like on a mobile phone that is kept in a portrait mode. And if I select this, I mean, in a landscape mode, sorry, like when you put your mobile phone when you are watching a movie, this is how this header will look like. And if I select this here, it means that this is how our header will look like when it is being displayed on a mobile phone. Now, you can see that on the mobile phone, the header is not looking okay. The logo has disappeared. That's not how it's supposed to be. As you can see, the logo is showing here, but when I view this in mobile, the logo has disappeared. So this is where responsive design in Bubble comes in. We need to configure our header to look okay on a mobile phone. So how do we do that? We are going to use Breakpoint. Now, don't think too much about it. Breakpoint is just the size of, um, like the size range that spices are designed to stay under like it's just like you saying um for mobile phones yeah it's just like you're saying for every mobile phone every the wideness of every mobile phone should not be below and should not go above 320 pixels and you and it is like you also saying the wideness of every tablet should not go be, be, be beyond 860 pixels now all of these are standards that are adhered to by companies that produce devices. So breakpoints are just like this. So this means that any device that is above 320 and below 860 or any number at all falls within tablet devices. If I come here, take note of these numbers here. You see we have 320, 768, 992, and 1200. Now 320 means that any device that is below 320 pixels will be recognized as a mobile device. And any device that is between 300 and, like when I say between 320 pixels, I mean the width. Any device that is, that the wideness is below 320 pixels will be recognized as a mobile device. And any device that the wideness of that device is above 320 pixels and within 768 pixels will be recognized as a mobile device that is in landscape mode. And you'd, and you'd, you'd believe me that there are some 
mini tablets that are like your mobile phone when you slant your mobile phone. So mini tablets are as wide as your mobile phone when you slant it. So all those devices will be will be recognized under this region. And any device that is that the wideness of the device is between 768 to 992, your browser will see that device as a tablet device. And any device that is that the wideness is between 992 to 1200 and above actually, your browser will see that device as a desktop, laptop, television, or any other large screen. So that is what Breakpoint is all about. Is that clear? Okay, um, Nuruddin, can you still hear me? If you can hear me, say yes. Is everyone hearing me? Okay, then. So, so that's it. So um, now, how do we make these elements here to actually look good when the device, when the web application is viewed on a mobile device? What we will do is this. We will set conditionals. And these are the conditionals that I would like us to set. I would say, okay, when this web application or when this header element is being viewed on a mobile device, let's reduce this margin that is 120 to let's say um, 16 or 8. You get it. So how do we make that happen? So first things first, I'll double click on this post a job button to have its property window show up. And I'll come here, you'll see a tab here that says conditional. Click on it. When you click on it, over here, you'll be able to set conditions for this button. Like, you'll be able to say, when this is this, let that happen. When that is that, let this happen without writing code. If this were to be in JavaScript, you would write some conditional statements. But let's take out this condition. If this condition was set by Bubble, I'll take it out. I'll click on remove condition so that let's create our own condition. Now, the condition that I want to create is that when this header is being viewed on a mobile device, let this 120 pixel margin space be reduced to 12. So I would come here, I would click on define another condition. Then as you can see, it is literal, like bubble speaks to you. It says when. Now after when here, you would say what you want to happen. I would say when. I would say current page width. When the current page width, right, is below 320 pixels. Now I would take it up. I would say when the current page width is below 330. Let's make it 380. This is me just being really safe. Now you can see this when the current page width, and remember, if the current page width is below 380, it means the device, the width of the device is the width of the device is really small. It's really small. So I'll say when current page width is below 380, I would set what should happen. I would say, okay. Let the right, let the right margin, this margin exists on the right. I'll say let the right margin be reduced from 120 to 12, just like this. If that's clear, if that's clear, everyone can say okay. You can say yes if, if that's clear. Okay. Kevin says I should repeat. Okay, then, now, let me check this out once more. Now, this button here, when I view this header in mobile mode, you would see that the button is staying on top of the logo. And that is because the button is still respecting this margin space of 120 pixels. But I don't want that. I want space here. So I would say when this button, when this header is being viewed in mobile, like on a mobile device, this margin space of 120 should be reduced to 12. And the way to do that is to come here, double click on the button, click on conditional and set a condition here. If that condition is met, my problem will be solved. 
So I would say define another condition. And I would say when, I would say current page width. Now current page width like means the wideness of the page that the header will be displayed on. So if the current page width is less than, now you come here and select less than. This is the less than sign. You say if the current page width is less than 380, let the right margin property be reduced from 12, from 120 to 12. Now this is my condition that I have set for this button. Now let's see what's going to happen. If I bring this here, you'll see that the, now that it's in mobile, it is in mobile display, the margin property is now set to 12 and we can see the logo somehow. Now, the, the other problem is this. We need to set a conditional for this logo also because the logo has a left margin property of 120. So we need to reduce that when this is in mobile display mode. So I'll come here, I'll double click on the logo for the property window to show up and I'll click on conditional and I'll say, define another condition. And I'll say when current page width is less than, let's say 380 also, let the left margin of this logo be reduced from 120 to 12. Now let's come here and let's select the mobile display to see if it is effective. Now you can see that this looks better. As long as the page width goes below, the wideness of the page goes below 380, the margin here will no more be 120 and the margin here will no more be 120. It will be 12 here and 12 here and that will make it possible for the mobile viewers to see the logo and the button. So let's see how this header will look like on it on a mobile device that is in landscape mode. That's it, looks better. On a tablet, it looks better. On a laptop or a desktop, it looks better. So is that clear? Okay, um, Temi says, I still have issues creating the header. So um, Temi, you can explain the issues better. Uh, to create the header, like I said, all you have to do is come here, click on new reusable, then just start creating it. If there's anyone in the chat that can help Temi out, I would, I would really appreciate that. But is this clear so far for everyone? Okay, then let's proceed. So I have been able to create a, a responsive header that will be okay on all devices. Now these conditionals are not limits, are not limited, like what you can do with it, it's not limited. I can come here and say, when the current page width is below 380, I can define another condition. I can say when this is this, when that, that, when that, just something like that. And I can also say when it is below 380, let's reduce the width of this button from the width of the button from 148 to let's make it um, 120. You'll see that when I view this in mobile mode, the button will be smaller in wideness. So you can use that conditional to actually play around with how your elements are displayed on different devices. All you need to know is these breakpoint values. Like if I say when my let's set a let's set a conditional for the seven six eight breakpoint. Currently, this is how it looks like. Yeah, the margin is still one twenty pixels here and one twenty pixels here. Now I can say for this button, let's create another conditional. I would say when current page width is is seven six eight. Let the right margin of the button be 24. And you'd see that it is it has adjusted to 24. If I click on 768, check this distance. If I click on 768, the distance has closed in. It is now 24 pixels. 
And I can do that here also. Let's do that to have some harmony there. Okay, now I'm going to put it, see, left margin. And that's okay. So you can see that this is device friendly. Every device is looking good. So if you have any questions, every device is looking good. Now, come back here and click on UI Builder to go back to this section here. If you have any questions, say it in the chat. If you have any questions, say it in the chat. But if you are clear and you want us to proceed, then we can proceed and test and test what we have done so far. Now, for the responsiveness, great. Don't worry yourself too much about it. You can you can replay it later and get to know what and and get to know how to handle it. So, I only have one person telling me to to proceed. Is everyone clear? Okay. Jessica, okay, chat with Miriam. I'm only clear on the conditional. Don't worry. When you replay the video, you would really get it. If you don't get it, then, re then reach out to me. Now, the way to center your button is pretty easy. Like I said before, use this um, button here. If I click on center, you see the button is at the center. It's as simple as that. So let's then um, proceed. Now, we have built our header element. The next thing will be to put this header in our home page. Remember, this header is a reusable element. Now we need to put it on our home page so that it will belong to our home page. Just the same way, if I come here and I bring in a component, I'll need to put it on my on my home page. Just the way I just the way I created this one. After I created the the component. I brought it in and placed it on this page, right? Now we have created a component or a reusable element. Now it is time for us to put it on our home page. And to do that, let's go to our home page. So to go to a page, come here at the top. You can see where my cursor is on. Click on this my header section there. You'll see all of these options come out. Now click on index. Remember, I said that index is the professional name for home page. So click on index here. When you click on index, you will be taken to the home page. And this is our home page. Now, how do we bring our reusable element, which is our header, into this home page? I'll scroll down here on the left side, and you'll see that over here, I have that my reusable element called my header. That is the name that I gave to it. So I'll click on it, hold it, and drag it into our home page layout like this. And it will be placed at the top automatically, just like this. Now, don't worry yourself about the way this looks. This is just, that's just how it is sometimes in Bubble. You don't have to worry about that. Now, I have placed this at the home page. So what do we do next? Let's test this in the browser and see how it looks like. So to test this, come here, click on preview at the top right corner here. When you click on preview, your web page or your website will launch in the browser and you can see what you are building as you are building. You can see what you are building as you are building, just like that. So this is going to take, mine is taking some time to load. I don't know if it's my internet, but you can see how this looks now. So you, you have some buttons at the bottom here. This is the debugger tool. You can take that out. Now, I, you can take that out, not you must take that out. You can take it out. To take it out, to have a cleaner page, come here in the URL. You can see where my mouse cursor is on. Come here in the URL. After the question mark, that is after test, you will see debug, debug mode equal to true. Take out the debug mode. Don't take out the question mark. Select the debug mode to true. Take it out and press the enter key once more you will see that this debugging tool here will be taken out. Now you have a clean page just like this. Now let us see if this is responsive in the browser the same way we designed it. 
to be responsive in Bubble. To check if it is responsive, I would right click on the page and I would select inspect. When I select inspect, this will be toggled like this. Now you can see that the responsiveness for an iPhone SE is okay. But for an iPhone XR, the responsiveness is not okay. Now for a Pixel 5, the responsiveness is not okay. For an iPad Air, the responsiveness is okay. For a Surface Pro, it is okay. For a Nest Hub Max, it is okay. Then for, let's look at a Samsung Galaxy. For a Samsung Galaxy, it is okay. For a Samsung Galaxy S20, it is not okay. Then for a Surface Duo, it is okay. So some devices are not okay. Some devices are okay. I'm still in the component section. Okay. Where is that? Index. Can you please um, explain to me? Okay, then, okay, then. I understand I have seen it. All right, then. So, so far we have this, we have our web application. Res the header is responsive on so many devices. Now, because of time, I won't want us to waste time to make all the devices to be properly uh, responsive. But when you are building on your own, you try as much as possible to make sure that it looks good on all the devices. So let's have this. Let's continue building. Now, the next thing we need to build here is this section that says explore remote jobs. Apply for remote jobs under two minutes. And this, um, this input field here. So let's have explore remote jobs created. To do that, let's come here in Bubble. Now, just the same way in, in Figma here. That I had that container, that I had this displayed, yeah? The same way I had this display that I created container, then created containers inside the containers to properly place my elements. That's how I would come here in Bubble and I would create a container. Now to create a container in Bubble is pretty easy. Come here, you'll see that we have a containers section here. And in the container section here, we have so many options that you can use to create a container. The most popular one is the group option. So I would click on group to select it and I'll create, and I'll use that group tool to create a group container. So click, hold and drag till you are satisfied actually, then leave your mouse. Now you can see that the name of this group is group A. Now I can rename it to um, hero group. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Now, <clears throat> renaming to hero group is the first thing. The next thing I would like to do is to ensure that this container stays, covers the whole page, just like the website itself. So I would come here, click layout here, and I'll change this container layout property from fixed to rows. Okay, I'll change it from fixed to column. Reason is because over here in our hi-fi, you would see that the items are placed in a correction. Like this is on top, this is at the bottom, and this here is at the bottom. So it is vertical. So I'll change this to column. Now, when I set the container to have a column direction, I will come here and I'll set the horizontal alignment to center, just like this. Then the, I want you to take note of something, in, something important, which is going to be the width of this container. Now, currently the width is set to fixed width. I'll untick this from fixed width. And when I untick it, I would have the option to set a minimum width value and a maximum width value. Now, minimum width is this. If I come here and I set, and this width currently in Figma is 800, right? Now, if I say the minimum width of this rectangle should be 300, it means that this rectangle can be squeezed, can only be squeezed to have a 300 width value. When it gets to, to to 300, it will not be able to squeeze anymore. That's the essence of giving a property the minimum width value. 
it will make sure that you are on you are unable or the container is on a, unable to go be, below that minimum width value so over here i would say for this our group container the minimum width should be 300 reason i'm setting it to 300 is because all of the devices here fall under 300 like I want that group to be able to squeeze across all of these devices, even under the mobile device. So I would set this to 300 and that's okay. Now for the maximum width, I would set the maximum width to 100%. Come here, change this to percent and type in 100 here. So I would say the minimum width for this group should be 300, which means that this group can be squeezed. The wideness can be squeezed only to 300 pixels when it gets to 300 pixels it will be unable to squeeze now maximum width which means it can be expanded to 100 percent of any device it is being displayed on that's okay now for the height like i said the height is always important but i would come here and i would set it to 480 and that's okay the height is okay now let's come here click on appearance and let's see if we can change the color of this group just so that you see what i'm doing clearly so i'll click on remove style here when i click on remove style i'll set the background style to flat color and i can change this color to any color but in our case i don't want to change the color to any color at all i would like to keep it as white i'm just doing that to demonstrate to you that this is actually the group i'm talking about so before I start placing elements inside this group, I would wait for any questions. If you have any questions. Okay, someone is saying, um, how do we make it responsive on all devices? That's what I just did with the minimum width um, property. So my index page, but my header section is not showing on it like yours. How is yours showing? No matter how yours is showing, to be sure that it is properly showing, just load it in the browser and see how it's looked and see how it is looking it, if it looks good like this then how it looks here doesn't doesn't really matter the other question is i'm also clicking on the group container and dragging but it's not creating the box the layout property of my container is not showing instead it's showing conditional and, tran and transitions it's not showing because you did not upgrade your home page to um you, you did not upgrade your home page to the current bubble responsive engine einstein that that's for you if you do the upgrade of the page you, you are working on you would see the the stuff showing up there philip say he previewed but it's not showing Okay, Philip, you would have to give me more time on that. And maybe you can um, do um, play around with it to see if it's going to work fine. But I would, but, but I would like to proceed. If you, have, if you want us to proceed, if you have any questions, I have answered Einstein's question. It's just only Philip's um, problem that's, that's not solved. If you want us to, to proceed, then you can say yes in the chat box and we can proceed. Okay, Kelvin says I should proceed. All right then. So, so this group here is the group that I would have this um, text that says explore remote jobs. Now I would come in here to have a text inside this group. I would click on text, bring my mouse cursor inside this group. Now, when you click on an element, click on the canvas, hold, click hold and drag like this now it is automatically staying at the top left corner of the group so i would come here i'll change the name of the text to explore you can call it whatever you call it then i'll change the content from edit me to explore remote jobs then i'll edit this to look really good what i'll do is i'll come here i'll click on it i'll click on the remove style i'll select dms which is my font that i am using then i'll make it bold then i'll set the font size to let's say 
36. That's okay. Then I'll set the alignment of the text, the horizontal alignment to center. Then I'll set the letter spacing to one, just like this. And that's okay for me. Then I'll center the text vertically also. And that's still okay for me. And I'll scroll down to see if there's any other thing to work on. There is nothing text color the way it is. So I'll keep this text selected so that, so that I can have the property window show up. Then I'll click on layout here. When I click on layout, I'll come here and I'll set the horizontal alignment to the center, just like this. Now the text is staying at the center. I would come down here and you'll see that we have a width property currently, which is a fixed width. You can see it says make this element width and it is selected. Now I would want this not to be a fixed width because setting elements to fixed width means that they won't be responsive. So I would come here, I would uncheck this. At fixed width, you see that the width of our text box covers the whole page. And that's really okay. So what I'll do is I'll come here, I'll set the minimum width value to 300. And that's okay. The maximum width value, I'll leave it just the way it is. I won't set anything there. For the height, that's okay. I don't have any problems there. For the margins value here, I don't have any issues there. That's okay for me. And that's okay. Now, okay, for the margin value, sorry, let's bring this back up. For the margin value, I would like this Explore Remote Jobs section to create some space at the top. Like I want it to come down. So I would set the top margin to 64. By typing 64, some space will be created between this header and the explore remote jobs. That's all I'll do and that's fine. So let's come here and let's reload our web page to see what we have. So you can see that we have explore remote jobs here. We are going gradually, gradually. So I hope that text section was clear. Okay, okay then. So I hope that was clear. I just have answers from two people. Okay then. So now let's test to see if this jobs is responsive. As usual, come here, click on responsive see how it will look like on a, a on a laptop see how it will look like on a tablet it looks okay on a tablet see how it will look like on a landscape mobile device it looks okay then on a mobile device you see it looks okay, but it's actually too big so i would like the size of this text to be reducing as the wideness of the device is reducing it's going to be awkward when um a text looks really big on a laptop and you are looking at that text on a mobile phone and it's really big it's going to be awkward so we need to reduce the size as the size of the size reduces so how do we do that double click on the text come here click on conditional when you click on conditional click on define another condition and when current page width is less than you say let's say 400 let the font size, let come and select font size. Let the font size be reduced from 36 to 24. But let's say 18 actually. Now, let's test that. Now you can see that on a mobile device now, the text, the text size has been reduced to 24. And that's okay. If I go to this side, it's increased. So you're able to set how our elements will behave based on the device that the element is being viewed on. Okay, someone says, my text stay under the same shape, sir. James, can you explain better? But does everyone understand this, making this explore remote jobs responsive? Does everyone understand that? Okay then, so let's create the next section here, which is apply for remote jobs under two minutes. So I would come here. James, you can explain better so that I can come back to you. So I would come here, I would click on the text tool once more and I would create another text here. So I would make this um, smaller. 
And what we have here is apply for remote jobs under two minutes. So I would come here. I would say apply for remote jobs on that just like this. So I would keep it selected. I would click on remove style. Then I would change the font family to DM Sans. I would keep the size set to 16. I would align it horizontally to the center. I'll change the letter spacing to have one. Then I'll set the text vertically like this. Then that's okay. I'll click on layout. And for the fixed width, I'll uncheck fixed width. And I'll keep the minimum value to 300. I've explained all of this before, so it should be easy to understand. Then for the height, the height is too much. I'll just set the height to 28. Or I'll set it to 32 actually. And that's okay. So this is how it looks. If I come here and I reload this, you'll see that we have apply for remote jobs under two minutes. So I would come here now. And I'll test to see if this is responsive enough. I'll, I'll click on responsive. And when I come here on the tablet, on the laptop device, it's OK. Tablet, it's OK. Landscape mobile, it's OK. And for mobile, it looks OK still on mobile devices. I think this looks OK on mobile devices. I think we should proceed here. Yeah? Okay, then my explore remote job stay on that body, the body shade we created earlier. The... Okay, my height is 32 pixels. You mean my height is 30 pixels? The body shape. Okay, then. So the next thing we need to look at is to create this input field and this button. Now, I want you to take note of something. Input field and this button are staying at two different elements, staying on a horizontal direction. Take note of that. There are two different elements staying horizontally, not vertically. This was staying, but this is but this explore remote jobs is vertical this is vertical but this is staying horizontally which means we need to come here create another group inside this group i would create another group here and obviously the group will stay vertically now i would create this group and i would set this i would set the container layout of the group to row because i want the items inside the group to stay horizontally. I'll change the name of the group to subscribe group. Then I'll keep this set to the center, container alignment center. Then I would come here, I would scroll down, I would change, I would deselect the fixed width of this group. I would, I would, I would make sure it is not set to fixed width. Then I'll set the minimum width of the group to 300. And the maximum width, I can keep it set to 100%, and that's okay. That's not bad. Now, for the height here, I would set the height to 72. That's okay. So it is inside this group that I will create input field and this button. Before I proceed, I'd like to know if that's clear. Okay, then. Okay then, so now that I have created this group, let's go ahead and let's create our input field and our button. So I would come here to create an input field, come here in the bubble editor, you'll see the input form section. Click on input. When you click on it to select, come where you want to create the input field. And this is it. You just create it how, and that's it there. 
targeted. So first of all, it will have type here inside. Now the placeholder will be type here. And I think we all know what placeholders are. Over here, the placeholder is email address. If I start typing, the placeholder will disappear. So by default in Bubble, the placeholder, when you create an input field, type here. To change that, I would come here in the property window of that input field, and I'll change the placeholder value here from type here to what, what, let's see what I have here. Enter your email for daily updates. So I would say enter your email for daily updates, just like that. And that's it there. So when you create an input field in Bubble, yeah, you need to specify what type of input data that you are trying to collect from the user. Is it an email address? Is it a phone number or what? or what you want to collect. So in this case, I'm trying to collect and collect an email address. So I would come here, I would set the contents format from text to email. Now, this will ensure that if the user types in anything other than an email, an error message will be displayed. So I would set this to email. Then I would come here and I would, and I would make sure that this input field will not be empty. Now, if the the user just comes here and click on subscribe. An error message will show telling the user to enter their email address here. So I'll select this input field should, should not be empty. And that's okay. So let's this input field to make it look better. I would come here, I would click on remove style. Then I would see the font family of the of the placeholder to DM sans. And I would set the size to 14 or 12. 12 is okay for me. Then I'll set the letter spacing to one. Then I'll scroll down. I'll set the placeholder value to gray. The placeholder color is, is good to be set to gray. The background color, I'll leave it set to white. Or I can come here and tweak this, the background color. I can set the background color something like this. And that's okay. Then for the roundness, I'll set it to four. And that's okay for this case. So let's come here. Let's click on layout for the input field. Now you can see that the input field has a vertical alignment property. This one is set to top aligned, center aligned. Can you, can you guys hear me now? Can you guys hear me? Okay, everyone. Okay, everyone can. Everyone hear me. So, I'll change this from. I'll change this from top aligned to center aligned to keep the input field aligned at the center. And that's it. That's basically it for aligning it. Now, this input field should not be set to a fixed width. Remember, I say fixed width is not responsive. So I would uncheck this, and. I would set the minimum width of this input field to let's say 300 and I'll set the width to 310, just like this. I think 300 is too wide. Let's set this to 240 and let's set this to 260. Okay, this size is okay, yeah? Now the height, I would set the height to 48. And that's okay. Now, if you come here, you would see that Bubble automatically gives us three conditionals. And these conditionals are not bad conditionals for an input field. I'll show you how it works when we load this in the browser. Let's come here, let's load our browser, and let's see what we have. So you can see that we have this input field here. Now, when I hover on the input field, you would see that a certain blue line shows around the input field. That is one of the conditionals that Bubble sets for us and it's actually cool now if i click inside the input field and i type yeah and it is not an email the input field will become red that is an error signal like hey you are supposed to type in an email that conditional was also set automatically for us by bubble if you don't like it then you take out the conditional but i hope this is becoming clear so far
Okay then. So now we have created this input view. Let's create this button in Bubble. This button will be created inside this same this group here that I created for this input field. So to create that button, come here, select the button tool here, come inside that group and create your button. Just like that. Now the button will be ugly first of all. Let's change the text of the button to subscribe. Remove style. Let's change the font family of the text, DM sans. Let's make the text button to be 14. Let's make it bold. Then for the color of the button, let's come here in Figma. Let's grab this color. Let's grab this color. Let's Let's grab this color code in Figma. I would come here for the color of the button. I would paste this color code just like that, and that's fine. Then for the letter spacing, that's okay. So I would come here, I would click on layout for the button, align the button vertically to the center to stay here like this. It's aligned to the center now. Now make sure the button does not have a fixed width also. Currently, it has a width of 176. I would come here, I would change the minimum width value to 120 and the maximum width value to 126, just like that. And that's why you can choose any size of your choice. Now the height, I would set the height to 48 so that it can have the same height as the input field. Now, if you see, uh, there is no space between the input field and the button. How do we get that sorted? We can get that sorted, sorted with the margin property for the button. So for this button, I can set a left margin value of let's say 12. And you see that a space will be created there. And that's okay. That's what we have. So if I come here and I reload this, you see that we have this. So this doesn't look bad at all. Now I'll come here for this button, I would select it and I'll change the roundness value from five to four, just like this. And it's practically okay, like practically okay. So is everyone following? Am I making it really easy to understand? Okay then, so now let's see how this is going to be on other devices. So I'll click on, on responsive, click on 992. That's okay, looks really good. This looks really good. And uh, this looks um, not really good actually, not really good. We need to make this spread. So let's set some conditionals. Let's set some conditionals. So I would say when Come here, I would say when current page width is less than 340, yeah? let the right margin or the left margin of this button be set to zero. First of all, take out the margin. Then I would say also let the let the minimum width or let the max width be set to, let it be 100%. Let the max width <clears throat> be 100%. Then also, I would come here now, I would set the left margin. Sorry if this is becoming confusing, but I'll set the left margin to 24 and I would set the right margin to 24 also. To have this look like this then for the then for the button i would set a top margin value also of 24. to have this now for this input field i would i would do the same thing i'll say for this input field when the current page width is less than 340, let the 
maximum width be 100 percent then i would also set the left margin to 24 and the right margin to 24 and that's okay so you can see that our web app doesn't look bad on the, on a mobile device this looks good for a mobile design i hope that's clear okay no one is giving me an answer all right then The margin is too close. Yeah, you can just set it. Um, and you can set it um, based on how you'd like it to be set, actually. Yes, you can, actually. Kevin, you can. Yeah, you can. So I am, I am actually glad you guys are, you guys are really full, the whole spacing, spacing issue. So we are done with this section. And this is it here. We are done. Although this is basic, but I can see that we all know that we are done. So this here can work. I can make this work where you enter an email address and you click subscribe and it goes to our, to our database. And I would like this to be like a point where I would want everyone to try where I would send this link. Everybody will enter their email address, click on subscribe, and I'll and I'll show you the, your email address in your database. And Arctic email will be sent to your email address saying that you have subscribed to our newsletter or um stop. I hope can I use 10 minutes to just do that quickly so that although I won't explain, but I'll just do that quickly in 10 minutes so that you understand how the workflow happens. I would explain as little as I can. Can I take 10 minutes for that? Okay, I only have, no, it doesn't happen by, it doesn't happen by, by default. I would have to configure it from the database and, and use a workflow for that. So first things first, let me do that quickly. First things first, I would come here, I would create a data type. I would call this data type, subscribe i'll then create a field here for the data type called sub email and i'll set this to text and i'll click on create so Then I'll click on create. Then when I come here now, when I click on this subscribe button, I'll do a workflow here. I would say, create a new thing. I would say, create a new thing for subscribe. And I would say, sub email. And I would say, input your email value and I'll reset relevant field and I'll say, okay, send an email to the input your email fields value, send us name, I would say job lesson. Or let's just call this something else. And I would say subjects. Welcome, welcome. Then I would say, you have subscribed. So this is like me doing a back end configuration. Then that's okay. Then I would say, navigate to the home page. And that's okay. So you'd see that if I come here now, and I reload this page, yeah? Now, take note at my, at my database. If I come here in the database and I click on app data, you'll see that I have a field here called 
all subscribes. Now, when I click on it, you see that I have no subscription email here. Like this is this is my database. It is currently empty. When I come here now in the web browser and I enter, um, let me say info at this dot com, and I click on subscribe. And I come here in my database now. If I reload my database, if I come back here and I reload my my database, you see that I have that email that I entered populated here. Now let me send the link to everyone. I want you to confirm that it will go to your to your database and it will automatically send an email to you. So you can click on the link and type in your email there. So everyone should try it. So I'll be checking here to see who has done it. Wow, a lot of you have done it. Shulamite has done it. Chi the Victor it. Atu Kelvin has done it. Einstein has done it. Yom someone has done it. So these are all of your records in the database here. So and I would and I would want you guys to also confirm that an automatic email was sent to your email address. Like the, the, the email saying, welcome, welcome, you have uh, none of that. Okay, email received. Yeah. Yeah, it's just got the email. So, so that's it. So is it just only Kelvin and Temi that got the email? All right then, so you can see that all of your emails have been pop, have been populated in the database. I have lots of emails here now. I've, as as you keep entering the email, I keep getting it here in the in the database. And this is just and this is just like the scratch the scratch of the surface to what we can configure with bubble here. So this is just the scratch of the scratch of the surface. So I think we keep getting new entries and this is all of it. All right then, so I think we can now proceed, yeah? So you can see how we were able to build a mailing list and an, an automated mailing list quickly without writing any code. We just only had to bend some logic here and there and we just created this stuff. All you need to know how to do is to really know how to do the front end for the front end to be responsive. And that's it. So I would like us to proceed at this point. Um, Uh, blessing the logic is not complicated it's because i have not explained the logic actually so now you see that we have built this section okay i think it's okay for the emails everyone has gotten their own email address that's okay that's cool so what we have done here is this we have built this section of the front end now if you come here in figma you would see that we still have this section to build where we have these job cards. Now, these job cards are all dynamic data, which means that, which means that we need to have data in our database before we will have these job cards show up. You get it? So what we will do is to build a section that will allow companies to put this data in the database because obviously companies will be the one to enter their available jobs before the jobs will be displayed here in the front end of the application. So we need to allow companies 
to be able to post the jobs by themselves. Just by themselves, without us, without us putting it on our own. So, so we need to do that. Now, the way to do that is that we need to also allow the cost to be able to sign up to the application, register in the application. Then whenever they want to post a job, the companies will have to log in, post a job, and the job will be displayed on the homepage of the application. That's what we need to actually to achieve this section here, which is this job card section. But before I build this job card section here, I'd like to, even if anything happens at all, I'd like to explain how to design a database in Bubble. Because it is when you understand how to design the database that you can configure the database to actually send and collect data the way you would want it to do, the way you would want it to send answer. Now, this is what you need to understand about databases. In general, actually, databases work in spreadsheets. Like if you want a spreadsheet, yeah, that's the data of or like that will collect the age of humans. Let's say this is a spreadsheet. If you want a spreadsheet that will collect the age of humans, then it means that you will have to come here and open a sheet. Like you, like you can see, this is sheet one. I can create a new sheet now. Now this is sheet two. I would rename this sheet and I would say age of humans, right? Now, that is me opening like a database that will collect the age of humans. If you open this um, sheet, you would come here, you write age, you write name, you write location, right? Like this is you writing the fields that you will collect for this database that is age of humans. You collect the age, the name of the person, and the location of the person, right? Now, that's how data work in a nutshell. In a nutshell, what you need to do first is to spell out the data you want to collect. <clears throat> like, in this case, I say I want to collect the data of age for humans. You, when you spell it out, then you will, then, <clears throat> then you will now write out the fields that want to collect for that data. Like, let's say I want to collect the data for a restaurant, for the department in a restaurant. I would come here. I would create a. I would create a sheet. I would create a database for that. I would call the database restaurant. In the restaurant, I would collect the database for the warehouse department. Now are the fields. I would say the warehouse. I would say the laundry. I'll just keep having fields, but all of these fields will belong to the restaurant database. I hope that's clear. Okay, so in Bobulia, we have what we call come here and click data. In Bobul, when you click on data, click on data types here. We have what we call data types, and every data type will have data fields. Now, let me explain this practically. A data type is like you saying you want to collect the information about a car. Now, car is the data type. Data fields for this car will be color of car. name um let's say model of car now these will be the fields all of these will be the fields for this car just like how if you come here in spreadsheets you would say um um let's say you say um exam people who passed the interview then you start writing their name their age their state you then you start creating fields now all of those things are data fields so in bubble here 
you'd create a like you'd create a data type first then you'd give that data type fields like if i want to collect the data and the data of a car and store in the database like i want to collect the database of cars and store in my database i'll first of all create a data type called car then i'll create fields for that data type that will contain all the details of the cars that will be entered that will be entered <coughs> excuse me that will be entered in the database can you guys hear me okay then so that is it so in bubble you first of all create a data type then create fields for the data type so for this card here this job card you'd see that if i want to create a database that will have all of these details eh, i would create a data type called job post then the job post will have different data fields like name of company title of job salary for job the experience for the job description for the job and all of that you get those will be the data fields so to create a database like this what you do is come here first of all create the data type i would say job post press the enter key that has been created now after that is created i would make sure i keep it selected i'll click on it to keep it selected then i would come here under fields you can see it says fields for job for type job post so i'll come here and i'll be creating fields i'll say for the job post i would want the companies to enter the name of the company hiring and this field type will be a text of course the name of the company will have to be a text i'll click on create i have created one data type for this I have created one data field for this data type. So after they enter the name of the company hiring, I would want them to enter the salary for that position. This is going to be a text also. Then I would come here. I would want them to enter the position that the company is hiring for. This also be a text. After that, I would come here. I would want them to enter the years of experience. Now, years of experience will just be a number. I would select number. We can type in three, four, five, six, two, or any amount. That's okay. Let's come here. Let's see what data types we are going to need also. So, salary has been documented. Experience has been doc documented. Um, title, position, and company has been documented. Now, when we come to this page where we have the details, where we have the details of the job, you would see that there are, there are other details that we need to factor in here, like the location of the job and the responsibilities of the job. So I would come here, I would create location. I would say location. Now I would just set this to text. And I'll click on create. And I would say responsibilities. And I would click on text. Now I'll create that. Is everyone following? Yeah, so what, so what I have done now is this. I have created the database design for how the job posts of how the companies, of the details that will be collected from the companies when they want to post a job. All of these details will be what will be collected from the company. So now on the form that, will, that the company will fill, when they enter the location that that job will be, will, will be um, like when they enter the location of the job, that data will be saved to this field. The name of the company will be saved to this field and so on and so forth. So I hope that's clear. Now, how do we build our web application to ensure that the companies are able to post this this information so that the information can be saved to our database because 
Actually, it is only when the information is saved to our database that we can use logic to grab it and display it on the front end for the users to see. But first things first, the company needs to post jobs, then it needs to be saved in the database. Then we can grab whatever is saved in the database and display it on the front end for the users or for the job applicants to see. So how do we make that happen? So the way to make that happen is this. We need to create a new page on our bubble app that will be that will be for the companies who want to post jobs. And on that page, we will just create a form that the companies will use to fill in these details. And we will grab whatever the companies fill in and save it to our database. And I'll give the link also to you guys so that you guys can also put in information and you'll see that saved in the database. So let's create a page for that. I would come here, see where my mouse cursor is on. When I come there, I would click on add a new page. That's how to create a new page. I would click on add a new page and I would give the new page a name. So I would say app, um, job post page. Now, when you are writing the name of a page in Bubble, you don't use space. You use underscore, job underscore, post underscore page. Now, Bubble gives us the ability to create a new page from an existing page to make the job easy for you. So as you can see, it says clone from. So I'd like to clone this new page from the index page, just so that I can remove some things and have some things remaining without building the page from scratch. You can see how that's really easy. I'll click on create here. And I'll wait for some seconds for the new page to be created. And this is the new page here. Remember, we cloned it from an existing page. That's why we have this exact same thing here. So I'll take some of these things out. I'll take this out. I'll take this out. Now we have just this um, group here. This group here. We have just this group here that has, um, that used to have all of those things inside of it. Now for you to preview this page, this job post page, come here and click on preview. Your browser will load the preview page. Uh, we load this new page. Now, now you can see that the page is empty. We just have the header only. The header will soon show up here. We just have the header only. So let's go ahead and let's create a form. Okay, somebody just said um, um, company logo and image. That's, that's correct. We did not include that in the database. So I would come here, I would create a new field. I would say company logo. That's correct. And I would set that to image. That has to be an image. And that's really insightful. Thank you for that. Now, somebody else is asking, sir, how do you edit already created fields? Now, when you, okay, to edit or, or already created fields here, okay, for now, Bubble has not um, created that. That's not sorted here in Bubble. If you have a field that you don't need in Bubble, you just delete it or you just create a new one. I think that's not really that's not really a hard job to do. You just delete and create a new one. It's going to be difficult when you have actually attached workflows to it. Then you can start rearranging your workflows. But at this stage, you won't really need. It won't be hectic, actually. So, I hope those questions have been answered. So let's go ahead and let's create a form that the companies can use. Job description. Okay, the job description is the responsibilities. That's Sholamite. The job description is the responsibilities. You can call yours job description, actually. So let's go ahead and let's create the form that the companies will use to post jobs on the application. So I would come here, I would create a text here. I would call this text, um, I would say, let's say, post a job, as simple, or post job form, whatever you want to call it. I'm not good with copywriting. I can write anything that, that, that doesn't really make sense. So I'll say post job form. I'll click on remove style. I'll set this to 18. I'll make this bold. I'll set the letter space into one and I'll center the text vertically. Then I'll come here. I'll uncheck the fixed width. Minimum width is that, that's okay. 
this is okay also and and for the top the margin top i'll set this to 32 that okay then for the margin left i'll set this to 120. let's see how it looks like now that is just like the title of the form that the company will see post job form after post job form they start seeing the fields i hope that's not a bad design so this is okay yeah let's see how it's going to look like when the page is viewed on different devices now i don't like this i'd like this to stay at the end here when the page is being viewed on a mobile device so i'll double click on this post job form text come here create a conditional that's going to say when current page width is less than i'd say 380 let the left margin value be reduced just like that so i like this to look like this on a mobile phone this is okay you can also change this actually let's change this to 24 i would say when the current page width is 768 now this 768 i am the one typing it so you guys should also know that you have to type it let the left margin value be 24. that's okay so this is okay so this looks good this looks good this looks good and this looks good oh let's create our form now i'll click on ui builder i would create the first input field here now your input fields, you design it how you want to design it. This first input field, I would say, enter available position. You can enter whatever you want to enter there. How do you spell available? Available, but this doesn't enter available position. Okay. And the position will have to be a text input now. So I'll keep this set to text. That's okay. And I would say this input should not be empty, which means a company must enter the available position. Now, for the design of the input field, I would like the text, the placeholder text to be DM Sans. I'd like this to be 12. I'd like the letter spacing to be 1. Then I would like the background color is okay. I can set it to this. Can you can you can actually play around that if you want. Set it to that. Then I would set the layout. The layout, I'll give it, I'll uncheck the fixed width, and I'll set the max width to 300. Then I'll set the minimum width to 220. That's okay. So for the left margin value, I'll set it to 120, just like this. The top margin value, I'll set it to 32. 32 is a lot. Let's set it to 16. That's okay. Is everyone following? Okay. So this is making sense. Now, if I reload this page, you'd see that I would have that input field there. Now, this is meant for companies to use to post what they have, the job opportunity that they have. So I would go ahead and I would create other fields. So to create other fields will now be easy. I'll just select this and I'll duplicate it. I can come here and start editing the details. Now for the for this one, it's going to be enter company name. Company name. And for this, it's going to be um what do we have? What did we have there? Location, position, responsibility, salary. Okay. The company name will also be a text. The company name will be a text. So for the salary, I'll say enter salary. Now I may be arranging this thing wrongly in in your own mind, but don't mind me for that. I'm not organized sometimes. So I would set the salary to be a number. So I would set this to integer. Take note integer and that's okay 
So enter enter salary, and for this, I would say enter let's enter location. location and have other fields here company logo is there but location is sorted this is sorted position is sorted. responsibilities and years of experience is remaining so i would increase the height of this group that is containing this take note as you can see the height of the group is almost ending so i would increase the height of the group i would click on the group double click on it you can see hero group is up I would increase the height of the group here to 800. That's okay. So I can create more fields. And this next field will be for the salary. So I would, okay, no, salary has been sorted, years of experience. So I would say enter years of experience. Now, years of experience has to be a number. I would set it to integer also. It has to be, it has to be an integer. And that's okay. Now, after the years of experience, responsibilities and company logo is the next. So I would come here for the responsibilities. I'll change this from a regular input field to a multi-line input field. Take note, multi-line input fields allow you to enter paragraphs like you can do paragraphing inside multi-line input fields. So I'll change this from a regular input field to a multi-line input field so that they can enter long responsibilities or job, de or job descriptions. So I'll right click on this input field here. You come here, you'll see, I would say replace by another type. Then i would select the type I want to replace it by. i would say multi-line input and I'll click replace. Now this is how it looks like. Now to make it look cool i'll double click on it come here now and I'll increase the height from 48 to 72 or you can make it 80 84 then i would come here i'll change the placeholder from entire years of experience to enter job description or enter job responsibilities i think that's what i called it and that's it you can make yours look better. Now, after that, I would put the enter, um, the upload company logo. So to do that, this is, this is what you do, yeah? Come here, under the input forms, you'd see a picture uploader element here. Picture uploader, not file uploader, picture uploader. You'd click on picture uploader. You'd come here and you'd say, um, Upload logo. A click when typing upload logo here, it will be updated to upload logo here. And you'd see that when I click on layout, I can come here, set this to 240, set this to 300, and the top margin, set it to, let's set it to 12. Then the height, I'll set it to 48. And the left margin, 120. And that's okay. Upload logo. Now, is everyone following? How did I duplicate? Duplicate is Control G. Click on it. Yeah, um, Einstein, you uh, yes, what you say is what you said about the um, stuff is correct about Figma. You can't manually recite the width of a text field. Yeah, so I hope everyone is following. So you can see the form that we have created here for the companies to use to post their um, the job they have in their companies. Yeah, so it's Okay, now, so let us um, put a button here so that when they type in all these details, they would click on post job. Let's call that post job. Simple as that. Let's change the color of that button to black. You can change it to whatever you want. 
then let's change the text on the bottom to DM Sans. And let's make the text on the bottom bold. Let's click on layout. And let's make the height of the button 48. Mm, let's set the width of the button to 220. Or, okay, I think that's two something, 280. Then let's make the top margin be 16. And the left margin to be 120. Let's set this width to be 300. Oh, this is post job. Now, if I come here, you see that if I load it in the browser, post job is there. Now, when you are building your website for a client or somebody, you can put any other information here just to make it look fancy. But in this case, I don't want us to stress about putting pictures here or anything because it's going to take time. So let's come here and let's see if this is responsive. I'll click on responsive. On the tablet, it looks like this, cool. On a landscape mobile device, it looks like this, cool. And on a mobile device, it doesn't look cool at all. So what the problem is, is this margin space on a mobile device is too much. It's too much. It's 120, so we need to reduce that margin space to 12. So I'll double click on this. I'll create a conditional that says when current page width is less than 380, let the margin space on the left be 12. This now looks okay. I'll do that to all of this, or maybe you can do that to all of that on your own. I won't really stress, I won't stress you guys. You guys can do that on your own to make it look good. So now what I would want you guys to do, what I would want you guys to see how it happens is, I want you guys to see how it is possible to collect data here and send it to the database of your bubble app. Now, if I click on data here to go to the database and I click on app data, you would see that on my app data now, I have all job posts, all subscribers and all users. But since we don't have a user yet, nothing will show up here because we don't have a user. Like nobody has signed up yet to the application, but we have all job posts here. So if I click on all job posts, you see that we only have the fields, company, location, name of company, position, um, responsibility, salary, years of experience. And we have other details like the company image and all of that but no data, it is empty because no company has posted anything yet. Now, I would want you guys to be the ones to populate these fields, but I would want to show you guys how to collect data from the front end from a form and send it to the database. So let's do that. Now, since it works like this, the user or the company will enter this, enter this, enter this down to this point, then click post job. This post job button is what will trigger the action on this page. It is when they click on this post job button that we will want the data that they have entered here to be collected and sent to the database. So all our workflow will be configured to this post job button. That's how it works. So double click on the post job button and then come here. You see on the, what, what they call it, the property window, you will see start or edit workflow here. Click on it. When you click on it, you'll be taken to this page, the workflow page for this button. Now, always read in bubble. You see that over here, there is a condition that says when button post job is clicked, now, the name of this button, as you can see here, if I click on it, the name of the button on the property window is called button post job. I can rename it to post job button. And I rename it to post job button and I click on start or edit workflow. You'd see it says when post job button is clicked, right? We are going to add 
an, an action here. We are going to configure what will happen when that button is clicked. So I would come here to add an action or to add what should happen. I would click here and you see that there are different actions here that can be triggered, that can be configured. That's why I say bubble is really complex and bubble is really broad because all of these actions can be triggered. You can, this accounts section here can allow you sign up or do all of these actions. The navigation can allow you move like this. Data, email, you can even configure payment. You can do analytics. Then you can also connect an API. Like you can connect a an existing API to your Bubble application and it's going to work live like a regular application. That's why Bubble is really complex. Like really, really, really complex. So I would like for us to say that when this post job button is clicked, let us grab all that the user has entered here and save it to our database. Now, saving something to our database means we want to interact with this data section here, right? So I would come here, I would say when button, when job button is clicked, I would click here, I would say, go to data. Now, what do we want to do? We want to create a new thing, like we want to create a new data because that company clicking on post means that they want to post a new job. That is creating a new thing. That is creating a new data. So I would click on create a new thing. Now, when I click on create a new thing, take note, hover on data first before you say create a new thing here. When I click on create a new thing, which is like create a new data, Bubble will ask me, where do you want to create this new thing to? Remember, we have data types and data fields. Bubble will ask you, to which data type or on which data type do you want to create this new data on? Because every data must be attached to a data type, right? So we will come here and we will select the data type in our database that we want to create this new thing to. I'll select job post. And that's a win. Now, when you select job post, you need to specify the fields you want to send the details of that new thing to. Like the job post data type has lots of fields that we created, yeah? So we need to collect one data and send to one field, one data, one field, just like that, so that it will be organized like, like a spreadsheet. So I would come here and I would click on add all fields here. When I click on add all fields, all the fields in my job post data type will be displayed here, as you can see. Is everyone following? Okay, all right then. So I would say, okay then, um, all, as all these fields has shown up here, the next thing will be for me to collect, to set bubble or to configure this app to collect what the user has typed or has entered and attach it to this field here. Now the first field here is company logo. So I would say for the company logo data field in my database, I will collect, come here and click on this. You come here and click on this more here. I will click on here and I'll say, I'll collect what the picture uploader element, like what the user, the picture that the user will upload to the picture uploader element. I would collect the value, whatever the user uploads to this, Let's come here. Whatever the user uploads to this field here is what I will collect and send to my database. But when it gets to my database, it will now be attached to this data field, this field here called company logo. So that's it. So I would, then for the location, I would click here. I would say, I would scroll down and say, you see inputs, enter location. Now, this thing here, this input enter location, I, I want you to, to take note. If you come here, if I click on location field here, double click on it, you see that the name is input enter location. That's why I advised you to always name your element or name whatever you are doing. It's going to help you. Now, if I come to my workflow, I would say for the location, for the location field, go to the input location um, field in the front end, yeah? 
that form field that is called input location, go to it and grab whatever value that the user typed in there. I'll select value here. Now grab that value and save it to the location field in the job post data type that is in the database. Is that clear? Okay then. So we are going to do that for all of the fields here. For name of company, I would say go to the input enter company name field and grab the value that is typed in there. I'll do same for position. I would come here. I would grab the value for responsibilities. I would come here. Um, where is that? I would grab the value for salary. I would come here. I would grab the value for years of experience. I would come here and I would grab the value. And that's it. So we have successfully collected all the all the data that the user will type into this form. We have successfully collected it and we have successfully saved it to our database. So what I'll do next is this. I'll say when it is saved to the database, like when this new data has been created in the database, what should happen next? So you'll see this arrow here pointing to this section that says click here to add an action. I'll click here and I'll say reset relevant inputs. Now this is an action that is recommended. It is always good that on a website, when you enter details and you click on enter or post or post job, everything that you type in into the form should automatically clean itself so that you can type something else inside there. It's not good for you to submit a form and the details that you typed in are still there. It is good to automatically clean it. And to do that in Bubble, just click, just click on that reset relevant input the way I just did it. Now, when the inputs are reset, we can now say, okay, add another action. Like let's say, take the user to the home page or ask the user to go to this page or that. But in this case, we have not connected our home page with the page where the companies will have to um, post a job yet. So we are not going to do that. These two actions are okay. So if I come here now and I reload this, I'll send the link to you guys so that you guys can send in post a job um, stuff and you'll see that in the database. So come to the database now, you see that it is still empty. Everything here is empty. There is no job post at all. But if I come here and I send the link to you guys, and I ask you guys to um, post a job, just take two minutes of your time and don't be offended with that. Just post a job and let's see how it's going to work out. Okay, if anyone has, if anyone has posted a job, you can indicate. Okay, um, someone is done. That James is done. So if I come here to the database now, you can see this is still empty. Let's reload that and let's see what we have here. Okay, wow, I have a lot of job posts here. That's 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 really. Fun. So you can see all of these here. It's even real time. It's coming in. I have TechPad, name of company. I have Temi. I have Ray Wild Enterprise. Awesome, New Banga Digital. Great company, I have Stems Technology. So you can see that the, um, how do I say, the, the companies are able to start posting jobs through our application and it will be saved in our database.
So you guys can see, yeah. So you can see that the whole details are being recorded real time. <clears throat> can can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay, so I think you guys have seen that we have been able to collect whatever you post from the front end and save it in the database. I believe this is I believe this is interesting to everyone. Right? So I know we won't have much time to maybe um, build the repeating groups and do a whole lot of detail like that. But I'll just show you guys how the only problem we have now will be to grab that data from the database and display it here on the front end. So I'll show you that it is possible to grab the data. So if I come here on the home page, I can decide to come here create what we call a repeating group and set the type of content to job post, set the rows to one and set the heights to 64 or let's set this to Okay, just um, quick, just a quick one there. Um, I just want to show you guys how to grab this data quickly. Then for the top, I'd say thirty-four. Now um, for the appearance. Mm-hmm. You can come in here and set this to, to this to white. Set this to actually I can change this background to this. Yeah, then I can set the roundness. I'm just being in a haste because of time, but don't worry. I think you guys will grab. So um, now if I come here in this repeating group, I would set the, set this to column. Let's set this to align to parent. To row, sorry about that. Oh. I'm setting this to I'm setting this for the wrong elements actually. So I would come here. Now if I come here, let's say I want to grab an element. Let's say I want to grab one of the jobs. Like let's say I want to grab the stuff from our database, right? Let's say I want to grab the stuff from our database. I would come here. Let's say I want to grab the image, the logo, first of all. I would come here, I'll select the image too. Then it's going to be a, a, a dynamic image now. I'll insert dynamic image. I'll say current sales job post, company logo. Now, don't worry about this. This may sound really complex for you to understand, but don't, but don't worry about it. I'll set this to 64, the roundness to 64. Then I would come here. I'll set the left value to 20, the left part into 24. Then that's okay. Now you see that if I come here in our homepage, if I reload our homepage, what was going to happen? 
if I reload the home page. Okay, I have a problem here. Nothing is showing here. I just have this card. Now, when I come here and I say data source, do a search for job posts. If I come here and I reload it, you see what's going to happen. Okay. We're having a glitch. Job post, do a search for job post. Um, we can have the problem there. Okay, the data is actually, okay, somebody's image is loaded here. Somebody's image is loaded here. Some images are loading, I think it's the internet. My internet is kind of bad. And as you can see, all of the jobs are being um, posted. I've been, I've been able to only grab the image, the logo. You can see that. Hello? Can you guys hear me? OK. So you can see that I have been able to grab the logo of all the jobs that you've posted. If I come here. And I grab, and I say I want to grab the, um, let's, um, let's say I want to grab the left margin, let's say um, 64. Let's say I want to grab the, Um, name of or the position actually. If I if I grab that and I come here and I reload this, you'll see that the position is what's loading. All the positions that you guys typed in is what is loading on the app. You see it, yeah? <clears throat> so you so so you can see that I'm, I'm I'm able to grab this without writing any code logic at all. So you can see what somebody typed. <laughs> so that's it. And actually it is as the it is as they keep typing i can say okay sort by created dates in the ascending order descending order so it is the most recent that will be that will be updated continuously this is the most recent job that was posted it's now reorganized So I hope I hope the so so I hope the session was was interesting. Okay. So um it's it, it's it's unfortunate that we we were not able to cover everything um, the way I I wanted it to be covered, but actually I would create some time and I would make this available on YouTube, like another detailed video on how to build a complete web app for this on YouTube, and I would just post. It. I think everyone here is following me on Twitter. I would post the link to the to the video on YouTube and. And I think that one is going to be really elaborate. But I think with this class, I, I, um, you guys now have an idea on how 
on how this works. Okay then, all right then. So um, you guys can still go ahead